us a sense of what's on the frontier with regard to gene editing. When I hear that, I kind of think of like immortality. Is that something that's possible with, you know, the exception of, you know, getting hit by a car or other things? I mean, will we be dying from diseases in the future thanks to gene editing? So the short answer is, uh, you know, not immortality in the short term for sure, but we may be able to create real functional cures for disease. So it's it's really it's really quite exciting. Uh, you see kind of three stages to gene editing. We're in the first stage right now. Can you give us a sense of where we are right now and where we are going from here? course. So the first stage, I like to call it CRISPR-Cas9. And we think of them, you know, as stages, but also that they can all work together. Um, they're all just going to be really important for different disease indications. So the first one, CRISPR-Cas9, you can think of it like molecular scissors. And so we cut the DNA on both strands, and then we allow the body to basically repair those strands and, you know, uh, get those joined, those ends joined back together. And you can think about it like a white piece of paper. And so if you cut that piece of paper, and then you put it back together again, well, it's not going to be the same as it was before you did that, right? So, um, you know, this could be really good, though, for a few different type of disease indications. And so one could be ATTR amyloidosis, which is when you create too much of a certain protein, um, the amyloid protein, namely in this condition. And Intellia is working on this. And so you disrupt the gene because you need to create less protein. Another example would be CRISPR therapeutics. And they're working on sickle cell and beta thalassemia, which are blood diseases. And essentially what happens there is you want to sort of disrupt one gene to reactivate another gene. And so that's been seen to be really helpful there. Um, and then we can go into sort of some of the more innovative or different types, which just basically increase the functionality. And so one example is, let's say you think of base editing. There's one company working on that there uh, that is IPO'd. It's called Beam. And what essentially it is, is you can think about it like a pencil and an eraser. And so if you think about it, you're on that white piece of paper again. In the pencil and eraser, you might have some lead, uh, little debris, you might have some little, you know, eraser debris, but essentially your paper will look a lot better than your first paper would have. And so this isn't going to work for everything, though. It will work for one third of all known genetic disease mutations, because um, it needs to correct base pairs that I just heard uh, the last caller speaking about as well. And <laughs> So, so this could be really exciting. And some companies working on Beam, like I mentioned, they're working on it for sickle cell, beta thalassemia, and Verve is working on it for the PCSK9 gene to actually target LDL or bad cholesterol. Okay, so if it's good for a third of diseases, you also cover stem cell immunotherapy technologies as well. What's at the forefront for those two areas? Sure. So immunotherapy, a lot of really interesting things going on. And actually, gene editing plays a big part in there as well. So, you know, we have things like CAR T cell therapy, which is basically like you can take cells out of your own body, have them genetically engineered to be cancer killing, and then be put directly back into your body. You can use, use your own cells, which would be called autologous, or you can use someone else's cells, donor cells, that would be already ready to go on the shelf when you get there, and that would be called allogeneic. So these innovations are happening both with CRISPR gene editing and as well as, you know, through other mechanisms as well. Um, in the ARC Fund, kind of speaking about innovation and biotech, as I mentioned in the intro, 2020 saw a lot of change and a lot of progress on that front. Uh, but in the ARC portfolio, my understanding is that you don't hold uh, Moderna or BioNTech, some of the key vaccine uh, companies, as it pertains to the COVID uh, pandemic that we are in right now. What's the thinking behind that? Why are you, uh, why have you avoided those so far? Sure. So we certainly do have mRNA companies in the portfolio. Uh, they just are not Moderna. We have access to it in some capacity because uh, there is a partnership between Moderna and Vertex, which is a uh, company portfolio name. Um, and they're working together for cystic fibrosis to use gene editing to potentially cure cystic fibrosis. And cystic fibrosis is a disease that affects the lung and digestive system. 
We also have several other mRNA companies. We have Pfizer in the portfolio as well. Um, and in addition, we have Arturis Therapeutics that is also working on a COVID vaccine, as well as using mRNA for other sort of different implications. And, you know, we think that sort of with the nearing to the endemic phase, hopefully, of this global pandemic, we know that people are going to stay at home more and people are going to go you know, less to the hospital, less to their doctors. And so that's why we think of the importance of things like Teladoc um, and other, you know, names that we can really think about during this endemic phase. And that's why also we think of, you know, mRNA in the gene editing context, because we know that while we already have the infrastructure built up for, um, you know, using mRNA for different indications, it doesn't only have to be for infectious diseases. It can be used in oncology, as we mentioned, in gene editing, in agriculture, there's a lot of host of, um, of indications that it can be really helpful for. Yeah.